please join me in a massive round of applause to welcoming Lord Mervyn Kipp. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I, I should apologise right at the outset for wearing a tie. Um, <laughs> Google is actually a lot more tolerant in this respect than some other places because I remember going when I was at the bank with some colleagues uh, to uh, the Palo Alto area and uh, Hal Varian, your chief economist, who's an old friend, uh, showed us around Mountain View. It was a very civilised visit. We enjoyed it enormously. And then we went off to Facebook. And as we got to Facebook, we were greeted by a young woman straight out of college who had this missionary zeal on her face. And we're about four of us, uh, and we were all wearing suits and ties from the Bank of England, of course. And as we walked in to go up a staircase, she pointed to a picture, because they spent vast amounts of money in, in Facebook doing up an old warehouse to make it look like an old warehouse. <laughs> and there was a poster on the wall with a man in a, you know, grey hair in a suit and tie. And she pointed at this man and said, that's the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm forever grateful to Google for being more receptive to people who wear ties. Welcome. We love ties. Uh, I'm wearing a TM Lewin shirt, which also puts me slightly out Very of impressive. there. Uh, so um, what do you see as the difference between engineering and economics? We're in an engineer engineering building. There's many uh, engineers in the room here. And you were saying earlier economics have started as a scientific engineering subject. Well, after the Second World War, it did. I think the, what was very striking in the early 1960s uh, was that there was an influx of mathematicians and natural scientists into economics. And people wrote highly mathematical treatises, the old idea of the invisible hand, Adam Smith, uh, Paul Samuelson wrote his textbook, highly mathematical. And economists got more and more excited about the fact that they could be like scientists and we could make accurate predictions. And I remember in the 60s, as a student, that people were constructing computer models of the economy and applying control engineering techniques to it to optimize the path of the economy. So you choose interest rates and fiscal policy to optimize the path of the economy. And this was a tremendous, you know, exciting development. And it all failed, completely <laughs> failed. And the reason is that it's of fundamental importance, and I don't think it's fully been grasped since, that. There are no natural constants in economics. Uh, there are no laws that you can believe hold exactly. And the, one of the things that's crucially important in understanding the behavior of the economy are people's beliefs about what will happen in the future, expectations. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these can be pinned down by what look like sensible or plausible views of the world. But other times, the future is so inherently unknowable you, there's no rational basis on which to form expectations about the future. And so in the book, what I, I talk about is that people don't optimize, they cope. Mm -hmm. And that is the big difference, I think, between engineering and physics, where you can genuinely believe there are laws of nature determining paths. You may not know what they all are, and you try and discover more about it. But once you've discovered them, they're paths. And, uh, and economics where there are no fixed scientific immutable laws like that. And I think economists are deeply reluctant to admit this because it will pull them back into the pack of all the other social sciences. Sure. Uh, and, and it was always very thrilling to be thought of on the same level as engineers and scientists. When you realize actually you're not, it becomes a bit of a shock. Okay. <laughs> um, <coughs> so the book is called The End of Alchemy, Money, Banking, and the Future of Global Economy. What do you mean when you say alchemy? Well, the traditional meaning of the word alchemy is to turn base metal into gold, trans change something that in reality isn't very valuable into something that is. That's clearly been true of money down the generations, paper money, electronic money. There's no inherent value to it. It depends on trust, people's mm -hmm. willingness to accept it, and the trust of the people issuing it. Um, but it's even more true of banks because you, know, you put your money in a bank that has a deposit, the bank tells you you can take it out whenever you want to, to make a payment or to have cash. Actually, if we all did that, they wouldn't be able to meet the demand because they've used the deposits to finance highly illiquid loans. So there is something, um, it is, it's a sort of alchemy to believe that all, all of us have deposits in banks which are highly liquid and we can use them whenever we want. And yet at the same time, they're backed by something that cannot possibly meet that demand. That's what I mean by alchemy. And by when um, illiquid, just in case anyone isn't clear, 
illiquid means. So the bank would make a loan to a household or a company where they would say, well, I will lend to you for 10 years for a mortgage or for an investment. Uh, and there's no way the bank can get the money back until mm -hmm. that period. Yep. So if someone walked into the bank and says, terribly sorry, I'd like all my money out, the bank can't then turn around to the people it's lent to and say, well, I know I said I'd lend to you for 10 years. Actually, the people that I got the money from have now come in and asked their money back, so could you please repay your loan tomorrow? Yep. And even if they did try to ask people to repay it tomorrow, they wouldn't be able to do so. And people might have to sell the assets that they'd bought with the loan and that would be at a, a, a lower value, a lower value at a you know, fire sale price. So that is the ultimate alchemy, that the banking system pretends to people that all the money that they put in a bank is, is highly liquid, that is, you can take it out whenever you want and use it, whereas in fact, it's backed by investments that are far from liquid. Okay. Uh, so the 2008 crisis is a large part of the book. Um, how did it come about, and how is that related to the alchemy on which the book is based? So the, the book is not a, a memoir. Uh, it's not a blow-by-blow blow account. We've got dozens of those already. And I didn't want to do that because inevitably that's self-serving. If I wrote a book about the events that happened, it, it would be from my perspective, and most of you would be sensible to say, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? <laughs> so I wanted to write something about the ideas behind this because it seemed to me that the, the first observation I had when I left the bank and reflected on everything was that almost everyone in this drama was in a prisoner's dilemma. That is, that there was nothing that they could do on their own to get out of this. Um, but the classic demonstration of this was Chuck Prince, who ran Citibank, who said in 2007, this famous statement he made, while the music's playing, we've got to go on dancing. Mm -hmm. So we're dancing. And within two or three months, the music had stopped and he lost his job. But the interesting point mm -hmm. about this was, if he'd said that five years earlier, and said, you know, I am very nervous about all these complex financial instruments that people are selling, and we don't want to do this anymore. We're going to get out of this market. We're not going to be so highly leveraged. That is, the bank was financing itself by too much borrowing rather than equity finance. If he'd said that, yeah. then Citibank would have been much less profitable in the intervening five years, and he would probably have been sacked before he even got to 2000. Because the shareholder expectation wouldn't have been met. The, the, all the other banks would have been earning a lot of money because they were taking risks. So Keynes once said, John Maynard Keynes once said that, you know, it doesn't matter what risks you take as a bank, provided all the other banks are taking the same risks. <laughs> and the, the, there was a similar problem for central banks because there was this downward movement of interest rates which started really after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, when you know, communism was said to have lost out to capitalism. Now we saw all this. And in fact, at the same time, what we saw with China and other countries embracing a market economy was that the number of people working in the manufactured sector around the world who wanted to export their production probably trebled. And that was partly responsible for keeping wages of most people at low levels, or at least no increases in wages. But it also meant that these countries who wanted to export a lot were saving a vast amount. They were saving far more than we were willing to spend. And so they were putting this money into the capital market around the world. It was a global capital market for the first time. And interest rates determined by the balance between saving and investment kept pushing rates down. Uh, and that meant that countries like the UK and the US were facing trade deficits because for different reasons, China, other countries in Asia, on the one hand, and, and Germany on the other, wanted trade surpluses. That meant that they were saving more than they were investing. We were, on the other, on the other side of that, had a, with a trade deficit, we were borrowing more than we were, uh, <coughs> we had to borrow for, for, from the rest of the world to finance the trade deficit. And our debts were you know, spiraling yeah. upwards. And everyone thought that we can go on doing this. But in the end, we couldn't. And that's really what brought about the, the crisis in itself. So the, the symptom of the crisis was that the banking system through which these flows of savings and investment were mediated, the banking system itself had borrowed a lot of money, uh, taken in more deposits, and became very fragile. So there were many banks that had what are called leverage ratios. That is, you know, how much has the bank itself borrowed from other people 
rather than financed through its own shareholders. But that was 50 to 1, which wow. meant that if you had a bank with, say, $100 um, million dollars of assets, you only had to have a fall in the value of those assets on average by 2%. I mean, the bank was literally bust, insolvent. So with that 51 to ratio, would the healthy amount be one to one? Is that the ideal? I don't think we know what the ideal ratio is. And this is where expectations come back, why this isn't an engineering phenomenon. So ask yourself the question, how much money does a bank need to finance itself through equity in order to persuade other people that it's safe to lend to the bank and they can attract funds and do their business? Before the crisis, we know the answer to that, which is hardly any, because banks were able to get lots of money from elsewhere with very little equity. Immediately after the crisis, the answer to that same question was a hell of a lot, <laughs> because people suddenly thought, God, banks aren't safe anymore. And the innocence of the banking system was lost. And the regulators really played no part in any of this. This swing in sentiment from being wildly optimistic about what banks could do to being extremely pessimistic was a change in, in sentiment. You couldn't claim that it was obviously irrational in any way. Um, people were trying to cope with an unknowable future. They made this judgment. And that is the danger with the banking system where if people can't get their money out and know that maybe if the bank is fragile they can't get their money out, then they may be tempted to run. And what happened in New York in September, October 2008 it wasn't that ordinary people, ordinary depositors, queued up outside the bank to get their money out. It was wholesale depositors, that is financial institutions, money market funds, hedge funds, all said to themselves, these banks aren't as safe as we thought, we'll get our money out as soon as we can. And that was the run on the banking system that reached its peak in New York in that period. Great. So on the, uh, you mentioned the normal day-to-day -day depositors, that you and I, do you think that the public's anger is justified at bankers and the banking industry in general? Well, I, I, I don't want to. I don't think we should go into this with, with sort of blaming people. Mm. I think people. I think ordinary people are right to be angry, but the reason they're right to be angry is because of a collective failure of thinking and ideas, rather than the behaviour of any one individual. So Dick Fold in Lehman Brothers or Fred Goodwin here in the Royal Bank of Scotland did not cause the financial crisis. Um, you know, it was much deeper forces than that. The difference between what happened in 2008 and the early 1930s and the Great Depression is that central banks and governments in the latter instance in 2008 expanded demand, cut interest rates to prevent a big rise in unemployment and that worked. However, that kind of policy stimulus is a bit like a painkiller. It conceals the initial pain, it brings relief, but it doesn't deal with the underlying symptoms. And if all you do is to give a patient painkillers, they don't get better. And in fact, it's quite dangerous to go on doing it too long without tackling the underlying symptoms. And I think that what people started to see was, well, yes, the, 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 we didn't see a massive rise in unemployment. We did see a considerable rise, but it was muted compared with the 1930s. But we don't see a recovery. We haven't got back to where we should have been. In fact, I would reckon that total national income is about 15% below where it would have been had we not had the crisis. Wow. That's a staggeringly yeah. large number. Uh, and that's an enormous cost of this crisis. And therefore, it ought to be the case. The two conclusions from that, in my view, one is that this shows the potential for rapid growth in the future if we do tackle the underlying symptoms. Uh, and secondly, it shows why it is that people are indeed angry, because their living standards have not grown as they should have done and yeah. would have done. And I think it's been compounded by the fact that certainly in the US and the UK, that people were, were taught that a market economy is good for you, that it can be unpleasant at times, you know, if your business isn't doing very well and people don't want to buy what you're producing, the government won't bail you out. If you're an <coughs> employee in a company, you may have to accept a wage cut rather than go on strike in order to protect your, your wages. And that's a healthy response to enable the company to keep employing more people. So embracing the discipline of a market economy was what everyone was told mm. was good for them and would boost productivity. 
And the people who were telling the, this to ordinary people most loudly were those who worked in the financial sector. <coughs> well, blow me. When it comes to the financial sector and the banks getting into trouble, where was the market, where was the discipline of the market economy? We all bailed them out. Yeah. Now, there were reasons for that, which was to protect the economy from the banks. Uh, we didn't want to see a collapse of the payment system. But you can understand why someone who hasn't read a lot of financial history or got a degree in economics would say, well, this is deeply unfair, and to feel very angry about it. And I used to have dinners at the bank in the immediate aftermath of the crisis, and I'd ask people, I'd say, why aren't people more angry? This is going to grow as time has gone by. And I think that is true. It is growing. And the failure of governments around the world to deal with it is the reason why there is support for extreme political parties mm. on both sides, both left and right. It doesn't matter whether you vote left or right, as long as you don't vote for these guys in the middle mm. who, when they alter, when one goes out of power and the other one comes in, same policy, no change. <coughs> it's, you know, th this, this unhappiness with what's going on, I think, is, is very serious, and, and, and it's not going to go away quickly. And then, uh, towards the end of the book, you talk about ways that you think we can restore faith in the system. So what do you think, in your opinion, the kind of the way forward is to make the system stronger and uh, more reliable? So I think there are, there are two sets of things. One on the banking side, which is, you know, in the short run, we've certainly made the banking system, system at least in, in Britain and the United States, safer. Uh, it's not as safe as it needs to be, in my view, but it's safer than it was. And I would think that over 10 to 20 years, if we really buckle down to it, we could eliminate the alchemy of the system. And, and I suggest that we turn central banks into what I call the pawnbroker for all seasons. In other words, instead of waiting until a crisis and then throwing money at the banking system, what we do is to say, if there's a crisis, we will lend you money, and you have to be in a position that you can borrow from us enough to pay off all the depositors. That will end the alchemy. But in order to do that, you've got to bring to us, well before a crisis, in normal times, your assets. And like someone would take a gold watch to a pawnbroker, they take the assets on their balance sheet to the central bank. And the central bank says, hmm, well, you know, you say these assets are worth you know, $100 million. Uh, well, we are prepared in the future to lend you $75 million on these assets. Yep. And the banks have to pre-position, have to bring collateral to the central bank, sufficient assets that they will have enough guaranteed credit line with the bank that they will always be in a position that they can pay off the depositors. Then everyone would know that there's no point starting a bank run because the bank will always be able to go to the central bank and raise the money to pay you off. So if some people run, that's, that's, th that's their right. There's no reason to follow them. Yep. Whereas in the current banking system, if you see people queuing outside a bank, the rational thing is to get in the queue. Because if you're last in the queue, you may not get your money. Absolutely. Okay. That's the first thing, I think, that make the banking system safer. The other is, what do we do about the world recovery? And I think that this is much harder. It's not obvious to me that any one country can get out of this on its own. This is the prisoner's dilemma. But I do think it's, a, it's a two or three things that go together. One is that fixed exchange rates, locking exchange rates, has not served us well. And that's true with China fixing exchange rate to the US dollar, as well as many other Asian economies. And it hasn't worked well within the monetary union in Europe. And I'll give one simple example. If you take Finland, a country in the monetary union, it obeyed every fiscal rule you could think of. Right? No one criticized Finland for not being prudent and tough on the fiscal rules. Then it had a big shock, right? Nokia. Nokia was about half the Finnish stock market, went down massively oh. in value. Russia in deep economic trouble now. Those two things uh, it administered a major economic shock to Finland. In the past, well, all right, these things happen, it's very unfortunate, but there was a shock absorber, namely the exchange rate. And the Finnish exchange rate would have fallen to enable Finland to export more and to import less. And that would have been a shock absorber to keep the economy going. There's no shock absorber now. They can't change the exchange rate against any of its major trading partners. And so what you see is that output is declining in Finland. Unemployment's rising. It has a major problem and no instrument to be able to deal with it. So I think making exchange rates more flexible is very important. 
I think we will also need to face up to the fact that people discovered in the crisis that in some countries, certainly here and in the US, we'd all been spending more than we now realize we should have been spending given the prospects for the future. We don't want to have spent everything out of our lifetime incomes too early. Mm. Um, and it's very expensive now to put money aside for a pension. But you know we need a pensions when we get there. And so people are being very cautious now about how much they spend. I think the only way to deal with that is to embark on a massive program of raising productivity. This will require a lot of small measures, different from one country to another. It will take many years. But as long as people believe that there is a coherent, incredible plan to boost productivity in the future, then they'll think, well, I'll, I'm going to be better off in the, in the future than I think today. And that means I'll have more confidence to be willing to spend today. I won't run down debt as quickly as I <coughs> might otherwise have done. And the third thing, I think, is that the experience of the post-war period is that trade between countries is fundamentally important to boosting productivity. We learn from each other. We get ideas, innovations transmitted through trade. You, you can see in your field that uh, you know, the, the, the flow of people and ideas is crucial. And trade in services as well as goods is a crucial part of that. So those are the things I think we will need to embark on. And then finally, I do think that the, there is a lack of effective cooperation amongst countries in the world. And if no one country can get out of this on its own, we will need greater cooperation. And I went to all these international meetings. My God, they were awful. And um, they, they cost a lot of money to put on. And you know, talking shop, as I say in the book, talking shops are good, but only if the talk is good. And it wasn't. Okay. Uh, we're going to open up to questions in a moment. So um, get some questions in your mind. Uh, one question from me. In those heady days of 2008, the late nights, or the kind of uh, takeaway pizzas, I imagine, what was the most surreal moment that you went, I can't believe that we're facing this? Well, um, actually, we didn't have any takeaway pizzas. We were um, just had glasses of water, I think, <laughs> was about the only thing. Uh, there were dramatic moments, such as when uh, you know, the Royal Bank of Scotland rang up and said, um, you know, we said last week that we were finding it difficult to borrow money except overnight. Well, actually, we can't borrow overnight tonight. So we're going to have we, we'll, you know, we, unless you give us some money, we're going to have to close the doors. And um, so I, I did something which I never thought I'd do, but effectively write out a check for, you know, for 60 million <laughs> pounds. Um, <laughs> and the, the only benefit of this is that when I've met professional sports people subsequently, especially footballers, if you want to get them to, because normally they're not very interested in economics, and if you've got to get their attention somehow, you just ask them what's the biggest check they ever wrote out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it is surprisingly high, I must say. It's <laughs> but then you trump it with 60 billion, nice. which they nice. have trouble understanding. The most, the most extraordinary moment, I think, was, uh, and it was a bit surreal, was after a, a meeting in, in Downing Street where I was with the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, and I went there with my private secretary. And people watching the crisis on TV found the whole thing rather dramatic, but it actually it wasn't quite so dramatic in real life when you were doing it all the time. It was just, you know, rather, it was grind. Anyway, after the meeting, we, we knew we were coming out, uh, out of the front door of number 10 to get into the car. And you may have seen television pictures of people coming out of the front door of number 10 Downing Street. What you don't realize, probably, is that anyone coming out of that door cannot see a thing because they're blinded by the lights of the television cameras and the flashing of the bulbs of the print photographers. Anyway, I knew this, so I got my private secretary. I said, check the cars outside. He said, it's outside. So I said to the man who stands inside the front door of number 10 Downing Street, the waiter there, I said, you can open the door now. So he opened the door, went out, fl you know, lights flashing the bulbs, couldn't see a thing. But I could vaguely see the car was there. So I got in the car. My private secretary went round the other side, got in the back on the other side. There was then quite a long pause before I said, very calmly, this isn't our car. <laughs> <laughs> and there was another long pause before we both got out at the same moment, <laughs> walked across Downing Street to where our car actually was. <laughs> and under the gaze of, well, it, it was no more than three million viewers. <laughs> and ITN News ran the headline that evening, 
governor loses his way. <laughs> <laughs> there do were a number of moments like that. Do you know whose car it was? Um, it actually seemed to belong to the charge of the Exchequer. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, lovely. So, any questions from the audience? Mics are coming round. Why not? Yeah. So the Guardian today has a story about um, the fact that intergenerational transfer seems to be broken, so that younger people, Generation uh, Y, are making a lot less money than they should. Uh, is that related to 2008? Is that important and can we fix that? It's related both to the causes of 2008 and also what people have done since to try and deal with it. So to my mind, um, it. You know, what happened in the banking system was a symptom of a deeper underlying problem. The causes, in a way, and I, I talk in the book about when the Berlin Wall fell, everyone wrote, you know, somebody wrote a book, Francis Fukuyama wrote The End of History, Capitalism had triumphed over socialism and communism. And the ir irony of this is actually it was the beginning of a process that led to the biggest crisis of capitalism since the 1930s. Why was that? Because what was happening in the world economy with the attempt to run massive export surpluses in China and elsewhere was that long-term interest rates were just being pushed down and down and down as more savings were being pushed into the capital market. And, you know, the world economy needs positive interest rates, partly to give an incentive to save for the future, partly to discriminate between profitable and unprofitable investment projects. And a lot of investments were made that were turned out to be very unprofitable. These have yet to be written off. So they, that will be a problem in the future. So what, what happens if interest rates keep falling? Well, the prices of assets, the assets are simply the present discounted value of a future stream of earnings. So even if you don't change your view about the future stream of earnings of shares or government bonds or the value of the housing services you get from a house, merely the fact that the discount rate keeps going down over a long period pushes up the asset prices. So it was no surprise that house prices and stock prices, prices of art and wine kept going up. However, that does create a serious potential problem in that the housing stock is always being sold from year by year. The older generation, people like me, sell their houses to the younger generation, people like you. Uh, and in normal circumstances, that's fine. The trouble is, if you've just gone through a period when house prices have gone up a lot, what happens is that the younger generation has to borrow much more money in order to finance the house purchase. Now, at one level, that's fine, provided interest rates always stay low. And then people like me sell the houses for much more than you could ever dreamt of paying for it. So, you know, I, I remember being astonished at the mortgages that were being taken out by my younger colleagues, people who worked for me in the bank the biggest mortgage I ever had in my life. And that was only for a short period, it was £50,000. Many of you may, I fear, have mortgages much bigger than that. Um, I never, ever believed I would be able to afford a mortgage as high as that. You know, I would, I've been horrified by it. But with interest rates so low, people can service the mortgage. Well, the, the intergenerational implication of this is that Old people like me, when we sell houses, end up with a lot of financial assets. Younger people like you who buy houses end up with a lot of debt. Now, the, housing, the household sector as a whole sort of washes out. So if you're fortunate enough to be in a family where the parents say, well, you know, tremendous, I've just earned all this money on selling the house to your friends, so I'll give some of you back, so you don't have to borrow quite so much to buy the house, then that's fine. But obviously, it doesn't work like that all the way. And the real, the real concern of the younger generation, I think, is twofold. And this is, I mean, I've always said I belong to the luckiest generation of all that is born in 1948. I was young enough not to have to fight in the Second World War, as my father did, and young enough not to even to do national service. But I was old enough not to have to pay a penny for my education. When I was an undergraduate at university, there were no loans. I even got paid a maintenance grant to pay for my housing and, and drinks in the evening and so on. Um, very generous of my parents' generation to pay for that. Obviously, that's all gone. And I was also very fortunate to have bought a house at a time when I thought, oh, gosh, house prices have gone up quite a bit, so I'd better buy a house. 
but way before the big house price rises that happened afterwards. Um, and the younger generation are stuck with paying for education, borrowing to finance that, and borrowing a vast amount to buy a very tiny apartment or house. Now, in the long run, this will work out, but the, the big threat, I think, to the younger generation now, and this is why I think concerns are really justified, let's suppose interest rates start to rise. Not now, but in 15, 20 years, just before, you know, you start to sell your house, well, house prices could come right back down again. Mm. And the younger generation will have been bought at the peak wow, yeah. and have to sell them at the trough. And the other problem, of course, which is a r really serious issue now, is that the pension scheme, which is offered to younger people, is so much less attractive than the one that I was offered. Why? Because the interest rate, which can be earned on the savings that go in to provide the pension, whether it be your savings directly as a, con you know, um, a defined contribution pension scheme, or whether it be the savings which your employer puts to one side through a defined benefit scheme, the return on th those schemes are very low. And the obverse of you know, high rates putting up asset prices <coughs> is that uh, you know, as interest rates fall to where they are now, close to zero, the cost of providing a pension in the future is much higher. There is no incentive to save. And these are very big problems, which is why I think it's very important that we get back to a normal level of interest rates sooner rather than later. So we have about 10 minutes left, so let's take three or four sort of shortish questions. Graham, yeah, if you pick someone. <coughs> Um, my question is that, so you know, regulators have made a lot of new regulations now. Yes. For example, Basel rates coming and stuff. But um, how do we know that the regulation is working? I mean, like unless there is a more data-driven approach to the stuff, like how would how would the regulators know that the regulation is working? For example, you know, how do we know that the leverage ratios that the banks have now are actually the right level? Okay, let me answer that very quickly. We don't. And we can't. <laughs> and we can't. And I am in the, there's quite a section in the book that explains why very complicated risk weights to calculate the requirements for equity cap capital by banks are, in my, I mean, let me exaggerate, but they're almost not worth the paper they're written on. Why? Because they're based on looking at past data which do not represent an engineering or scientific law, but they happen to represent a particular set of correlations over a period. And th when a crisis occurs, it's because something totally unexpected happens, which economists don't anticipate. And when that happens, the calculations of correlations and covariances that go into the official regulatory measures are irrelevant. They don't work in a crisis. That's why I want something very, very simple. And having enough pure equity finance is guaranteed to absorb losses. And you need a lot more of that, in my view, in the long run, than banks have today. And uh, we have more than time now for second question. Well, no, we have some Let's others. I think we take have this person over here. Come back at later if we have a chance. So I, I guess you probably don't want to comment on the current euro referendum directly. But um, <laughs> can you, we were, in 2008, we were in the unusual position of being in the EU but not in the euro. And so that gave you some freedoms but some constraints. Can you comment on? How much difference did it make to you being in that position? Yes, I can certainly do that. And indeed, there are <coughs> quite a lot of countries in the European Union that are not in the euro. And I think that's going to be, that, that will continue. And one of the problems that the EU needs to face up to is the fact that it needs to recognize much more explicitly than it's done so far that there are indeed two types of member, those in the euro and those not. The real benefit to us in not being in the euro goes back to what I said about Finland earlier. In 2009, sterling fell quite sharply by around 25%. And that did enable us to see a benefit by having higher exports and lower imports than we would otherwise have done. The trade position did improve. That was not enough to generate a satisfactory recovery because the euro area was growing very weakly and that's our biggest trading partner. So I do think that having that exchange rate flexibility is important. And I think it's important that other countries get back to that as well. That was when the world economy worked, in my view, more, more efficiently. Yep. Hi, thanks very much for your talk. Um, to your point before about how economics lacks 
fixed laws in the way of science and engineering. Uh, myself and my friends worry about um, all our hard-earned savings, putting it down as a house deposit and for there to be a recession or a crash and house prices to fall literally overnight. So would you say just kind of don't worry about that and go for it because you can essentially have to? Or are there any kind of like tips or advice you have given what's happened in recent years in terms of investing in it and buying property? How can we all get rich? <laughs> or just not really poor? Yeah. Yes, I think that's a better question. I mean, I think there are no simple ways of becoming rich, and I'm always struck by, you go into an airport bookstore and you see some book by a famous industrialist, you know, my advice on how to succeed in life. No one ever writes a book saying, boy, was I lucky. <laughs> uh, and, and in fact, there's an awful lot of that in the outcomes that determine relative rewards. Um, I'd probably be, be uh, arrested if I tried to give investment advice without having a qualification to, to, to do so from the regulator. But I, I think there are no simple rules. There's no mechanical uh, way of, of guaranteeing returns. And certainly, if anyone says to you, I really know a great investment, just be deeply, deeply skeptical. Um, I would say to suggest that it is very important to put money aside for a pension. Uh, and I think that if you are sensible and careful and find a property that you think you'll be able to afford over 20, 30 years, then that is a good investment. The key thing is to avoid, if you're going to move frequently, then rent, don't buy, because the costs of buying and selling are so horrendously high. But I have no, no simple advice, and I can't claim to be you know, an investment expert. Um, but you know, the people who, d don't be too greedy, and don't let other people manage your money for you. So what it, to my mind, I, what I find quite astonishing is that there are you know, big institutional investors, like pension funds, who have decided to put money into a hedge fund that, at least until recently, would typically say, yeah, we've got these very smart, clever people, and we can you know, make more money than you'll ever be able to work out how to make. And all you have to do is to pay our fees, and our fees are 2% of the capital value each year, plus 20% of the profit. Now, if you think about some investment earning 5% a year, and you have to pay you know, two of those five percentage points in fees, plus another fifth, another one in the profits. So that's th at least five percentage points yeah. return on the asset. Three goes in the fees. And the interesting thing about that is, if you just think about the law of compound interest, then instead of growing at 5% a year, your investment's growing at 2% a year. You've only got to be in this fund for five, 10 years, and most of the money that's been earned has gone to the fund managers and not to you, even though it's your money that's financing the investment. So I'd be very, very cautious about investing your money when other people are making the decisions. Particularly when they don't have any skin in the game, which seems to be one of the, like, yeah, so their, their, their money's not at risk. So the person who obviously has the best investment record over a long period is Warren Buffett. Now, actually, it hasn't been very good in the last couple of years. And he's worrying about, he's very old now, he's worrying about who to hand it on to. But over 40 or 50 years, what he did was <coughs> to say, if you buy shares in my you know, management fund, um, I don't charge fees or anything. You become shareholders with me. And I own some of the shares in my company, Berkshire Hathaway. And he bought lots of other companies. And he had the basic, sensible rule of thumb. He only ever bought things he understood and where you could judge whether someone was a good manager. So never invest in something you don't understand, and never invest in something where other people are charging you fees for managing your, your money. Great. Let's take a question from over here. Um, so if the UK does vote to leave the EU, what would be the impact to the UK economy? In the EU? Well, that comes awfully close to you know, asking me what my view would be. And, 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 I, and I don't want to do that because uh, the position I've taken, I did it in, in an interview with BBC earlier today. I've, I had a very interesting experience in the village I live in. Uh, you know, sometimes people come up and say, you know, what do you think of this new man at the Bank of England? And what do you think about interest rates? But when it comes to the question of Brexit, they do not say to me, so, so how do you think we should vote? What they say is, because they do not want to be told or even advised 
by a former governor of the Bank of England, or for that matter anybody else, which way to vote. What they do want is, is what are the arguments, <coughs> what, what are the facts? They want facts and arguments to enable them to make up their own minds. And this is a very important national question. People should make up their own minds. And what is so awful about this campaign is that people are treating it as a kind of PR campaign where you look in the newspaper and some list of, whether it's industrialists or financiers, it's, it'll be footballers and film stars soon. Mm. You know, <laughs> which side are they on? And I think this is completely valueless. And what I want is to have, and I said this in the interview, the BBC has a big responsibility here to set out all the arguments and all the facts. We've got four months before we have to make up our minds. There's no rush on this. So that people can go away, think it through, and decide, and then cast their vote. Because if we don't do it that way, my worry is that it could be rather like the Scottish referendum, in which the referendum didn't actually settle anything. I don't think this referendum took the issue off the table. It's still there. And that's in part because it was fought as a PR campaign, with both sides exaggerating. Um, and it, I think it's very sad that, that people can't, you know, wh whichever side you're on, it ought to be possible, in my judgment, given the issues at stake here, for people to say, well, yes, I and you've got a good point there. I, I see that. And that's why you want to stay in. Um, but here's another argument that really matters to me, and that's why, you know, in the end, I'm going to vote to leave. And the other person can say, well, you know, I, I accept there is an argument for leaving, but actually, this argument is more important to me, so I'm going to vote to stay in. That is the basis on which the debate should be carried out. The idea that it's blindingly obvious what the answer is. The only problem is that half of the people think it's blindingly obvious we should stay <laughs> in, and the other half is blindingly obvious we should leave. This is treating people as idiots. And actually, you know, we have a jury system to try people in court. Why? Not because these people are technical experts, but because ordinary people have a pretty good ability to judge when someone's telling the truth. And what I do think is that a referendum is only sensible if people are given the chance to make up their own mind. Otherwise, you, there'll be a call for the same referendum all over again in a year or two when some other development takes place. So th that's, that's all I'm going to say. Lovely. We will leave it there uh, in the essence of time. Oh, we've got one very quick question. One very quick question. Maybe something lighthearted? <laughs> it's not super lighthearted, but I'll make it a little bit different. So um, you spoke about the value of floating exchange rates to act as a shock absorber in uh, various economies. Um, why do you think it is that the US dollar works, or does it work, um, for such a diverse country, you know, over 300 million uh, people living there, very different uh, industries across the states? Why, why does that union work? Well, very briefly, it's partly because people move all around the United States. If, if one part of the US economy suffers through, because it can't change its exchange rate, then what you need to do is some people have to emigrate and leave, and people don't worry too much about that. And because th through one mechanism or another, whether it's social security or the tax system, the richer parts, the more successful parts of the US will actually transfer resources to the poorer parts. But even within the United States, there are parts which are clearly economically unsuccessful, deprived almost, and bits which are very successful. The fundamental thing is that no one in the US says, look, I'm not American, I, I don't come from New York, and I resent these people you know, failing to pay me money or telling me how to run our taxes and spending here. People feel American. And one of the chapters of the book talks about the link between money and nation. And over a very long period, there has been a remarkable one-to-one uh, -one correspondence between nations and their money. And I think that is not an accident. Uh, it's because if you live in one nation, if you're part of it, you, you're willing to accept the decision of a majority that the outcome is one that you won't accept and you won't rise up in rebellion against it. And, and that's of fundamental importance. And that's true within a country. And it's not true between countries. Great. Uh, please join me in a massive round of applause in thanking Lord Merton. <laughs>